Father, we give you praise and we thank you for this day that you have given us. We thank you for the time that we are in this place and for everything that you are going to communicate unto our hearts. Even as we share your word, my prayer is that we will receive that word like a seed that is good and going into a good ground. That it will bear much fruit in us in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, today I'm going to be talking about these things. Everybody said these things. And I get the title of my message from the portion of scripture that we are going to read. And I'm sure we cannot exhaust everything in there. But let us see how much the Lord enables us to cover today within these uh, scriptures. And then we will continue with it probably another time. But let us see what the Lord would like us to get from his word this day in Jesus' name. I want us to go to a scripture in 2 Peter chapter 1. And uh, we will read the first 10 verses. Let us use the English Standard Version, ESV. Uh, this is Simon Peter. And he is writing a letter to the brethren, to the children of God. And he says, Simeon, or Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ... To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he says, may grace and peace be multiplied unto you. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, my prayer for you this day is that the grace and the peace of God shall be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. That is how we pray the word. Hallelujah. And he says in verse 3, his divine power, talking about God's divine power, has granted to us all things. Somebody say all things. Did everybody say all things? All things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. And he says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord. They keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers... Be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Now, I love the way that the English Standard Version brings out the English so clearly. But now I'll read it in the New King James Version. Just the last three verses that I read. And how he says them. Hallelujah. From verse 8. What does he say? Let us read together. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren, that is ineffective, nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
For he who lacks what? These things is short sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. And he says, Therefore, brethren, turn to somebody and tell them, Therefore, my brother, even the sister, you told her, My brother, ah, now you can obey. Tell them, Therefore, my brother, my sister, be even more diligent to make your call and your election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Hallelujah. I want us to talk about these things that Peter is talking about here. He calls them these things, these wonderful things. Which kind of things? The things that will make you effective in your Christian walk. The things that will help you never to stumble. The things that will make you fruitful and productive as a child of God. For he says, if you do these things, you'll be neither barren nor unfruitful. Or if these things are yours and they abound. In other words, if they are in you and they keep increasing in you, you will neither be barren, that is ineffective in the way you serve, in the way you minister to God, in the way you do the things that you are meant to do, you will not be ineffective, no unfruitful. You will be able to bear fruit. Okay? So he says, you will be neither barren, no unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he also finishes in verse 10 by saying, if you do these things, you will never stumble. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, these things that we are about to talk about, if they are in you and they are bound in you, if they increase in you, you will not fail, you will not stumble, you will not be ineffective, you will not be barren, you will not be unproductive, you will be fruitful. Hallelujah. Clap your hands to Jesus. And you know here at Commission Transformation Church, we are here to make productive disciples. We are here to make sure that we make disciples of Jesus Christ that bear fruit. We do not want to make disciples that are barren. We do not want to make productive, uh, disciples that are unproductive. You need to be a productive disciple of Jesus Christ. You, you cannot afford to be in Jesus and at the same time unfruitful. You are supposed to bear fruit. Help me remind that person. Tell them you are supposed to bear fruit. That is the title of your message. Go ahead and preach it to them now. Uh -huh. Preach, preach. Add scriptures. Tell them, encourage them. Even for a minute you are failing. You cannot fail to preach for a minute. Preach to them. Hallelujah. You must have fruitful growth in the faith. Hallelujah. Tell somebody you must have fruitful growth in the faith. Mm. You are not here to just count the many years you are in church. Growth without fruitfulness is, is a problem actually. It is not just bad, but it is a problem. Because it even discourages others from growing. It makes Jesus look weak. It makes the kingdom of God look unproductive. You must have fruitful growth in the faith. And that's why he's giving us these things that help us to be fruitful, that help us to grow with purpose in the faith, showing some results. And how does it begin? He says, for this very reason, no, let me begin from where he begins from. He says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's telling us the power of God has given us all things. And you have to understand this child of God. 
God has given you everything. All things that pertain to life and to godliness. But those things are not going to just come automatically. There are things that you should have. Qualities that you must possess. Things that you must do in order to see all the things that pertain to life and to godliness come to you. So the ball is now in your hands. But when it comes to God, God has given you everything that pertains to life and to godliness according to his divine power. There is nothing you cannot attain. There is nothing you cannot achieve. There is nothing you cannot do when you have the power of God upon your life. Because that power grants you access to all things that pertain to life and to godliness. Hallelujah. And he says, he has done that through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given to, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. Hallelujah. God has given us great and precious promises. Promises that we can stand upon and wait upon him. Promises that we can stand upon and declare the glory of God. Promises that we can stand upon and be steadfast in the faith. And he says that through these, these promises, you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So, when we escaped from the world, did you know that your coming out of the world was an escape? It was not just like walking out of the world. Because the devil would not just let you go. Your coming out of the world was a great escape. The greatest escape of your life. And he says after you have come out of the corruption of the world. You are not going to just stay with nothing. When you escape the corruption of the world. And you come to this side. You become a partaker of the divine nature of God. According to every promise that he has given you. Hallelujah. And he says, but also for this very reason, give all diligence. Giving all diligence. All what? The first thing of these things is diligence. If you are to be a partaker of everything that God has given you in every good thing, you must ensure that you are diligent. He says, giving all diligence. In other words, you give in everything. When you choose to pray, pray, giving all diligence. When you choose to believe, believe very diligently. When you choose to give, give diligently. If you are to be a partaker of the of, of everything that God has given you through his power, you must be diligent in every good thing. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, you must be diligent in every good thing. Hallelujah. So he says, giving all diligence. In other words, even all the things he's going to mention, you don't just do them. You don't just be them. You be them diligently and you do them diligently. And what does diligence mean? Diligence means you put in your all. You give something all your attention. If you are to pray diligently, you pray with your all and not for once, but consistently. Putting your all into something consistently. That is what diligence means. Some people pray fervently but not diligently. It is once in a while. But if you want to see everything God has given to you coming to pass, when you choose to pray, don't only pray, but pray diligently. That means you are not going to give up tomorrow. It means you are not going to do it halfway. It means you are not going to pray for some two weeks and then stop. There are some Christians that say they are very prayerful, but their prayerfulness is in seasons. They fast for 40 days, and after the 40 days are done, they take four months without any serious praying. 
So you can see the fervency in those 40 days. But there is no diligence over the next four months. You need to be diligent. Consistent in the way you do things and not, 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 not just a little bit. But you do it all the way. Giving all diligence. Having or showing care in one's work or desires. That is one of the English meanings. You showing care. You are not just doing it, but you do it carefully. You do it with all this love. And many of us lack that quality. We do sometimes, but not diligently. But whether you are giving, whether you are praying, whether you are reading the word, whether you are praying, I mean, uh, praying for somebody, or preaching, or praying for the nation, do it diligently. Put in your heart. Show that you really care about whatever you're saying you're doing. And then he says, number two, add to your faith virtue. The second thing here is faith. Okay? So, having known that diligence cuts across the board, that even when you choose to apply your faith, you apply your faith diligently. Before you add anything else, start with faith. You are not adding to your prayers, first and foremost. Whatever comes is added to your faith. There is nothing else that you can do with this Christian walk without faith. Diligence is universal. Even people who do not know Jesus, as long as they are to succeed in this life, you'll discover this one thing about all of them. All of them have diligence in whatever they do. Whether they are Muslims, that is a universal principle. If you are not diligent, you cannot succeed in this life. But when it comes to the Christian faith, minus the universal principle of diligence, faith comes first. Faith. And you know, it is amazing how these things are not new. I love the way he said it in verse 12. Of, we never read it. But he says, For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. What was Peter doing? He was reminding them of these things, not once, not twice, but always. He says, I will not stop. I'm not going to stop reminding you of these things, though you know them. Ask your neighbor, neighbor. Have you been preached to about faith? Do you know about faith? I know you know. Mm, I know you know. Even Peter knew that these guys knew. And he knew that they were established in the present truth of that day. Some of you are not even established. And some of you don't even know. But if you preach to those who knew and were established, I'll preach it to you again. Hallelujah. He says, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. Why is he saying that? Because the principles of our faith do not change. Some of us read so many books trying to find all the ways to success. Let me tell you, whatever you read, regardless of whether you have a library, the seven ways to succeed, the ten ways to go up, the five ways to lie down and to get up, the fifteen ways to increase, whatever you read, if it is Christian, it is going to come back to the same principles in this one book called the Bible. The principles of our faith never change. The things that Peter writes about are the things that Paul writes about. They're the things that Jesus tells us. The same things that maintain the church of Corinth are the same that maintain the church of Ephesus. The same that maintain the church of Uganda. Or the church in Uganda. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> the same principles that maintain the church in England, 
that maintained the church in the 1970s are the same principles that maintain the church in Uganda up to this day. Hallelujah. So there are no new things. And for some of you that is bad news. Because like you are like those guys that were in Acts 17. Always looking for a new thing. Have you ever read about those guys? Have you ever read about them? Let me try to get them for you. For those of you that have never seen them. And you know, that is how the world is. The world is full of people that just want a new thing. And when they come to church, they're like, you get a yechipia. You get a faith. I've heard about faith a lot. I want something new. Eh? Some of us are like that. We, want, we just want a new thing. A new thing. So, in Acts 17, let me find these guys. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes. You can read about these guys from Acts uh, chapter 17 from verse 18. He says, There then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him and some said what will this babbler say other some he seemeth to be a a sailor okay let me give you a simpler version for some of you that may not know who a babbler is let's let's get something simpler hallelujah he says that certain uh, philosophers Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, I think that is in your English for you, also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. He was not preaching a new gospel. It was just Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Aeropagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you were presenting for you bring us some strange things to our ears. We wish to know therefore what these things mean. And the Bible says, now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. There are people like that. They just sit around to say, uh huh, kapiach. Then they talk about the latest land cruiser. Then they talk about the Premier League. Then they talk about the latest building in the city. The, 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 the new restaurant. And that's their business all day long. Now when you come with that mindset to the scriptures and to the Christian faith, you might be disappointed. Because guess what? There is nothing new. There is no new principle. There is no new way of succeeding. And that's why Peter tells these guys, I'm not going to stop reminding you always of these things. Why isn't he stopping? Because there is nothing new that he can tell them. When you want to succeed in the Christian walk, you will still have to stick to these same principles. So I too, just like Peter, I will not be negligent and I will not stop to remind you of these same things though you know them and you're established in the faith. Hallelujah. Faith is one of those things that will never change. And you know, there is a point where the Bible tells us examine yourself to see if you're still in the faith. Do you know why he says that? Because a time can come and a man of faith ceases to be a man of faith. And that's why we have to keep reminding ourselves that it is not about sight, it is about faith. There is no way we can win as children of God if we do not walk by faith. Some of you have walked by faith since you got born again till last year. Ask your neighbor, neighbor, when did you stop walking by faith? 
I'm telling you, some pastors and ministers of God serve God for years, living by faith. And they get somewhere and they get tired of living by faith. And they begin living by sight and calculations. It's very possible because a life of faith is a life that strains sometimes. And that is the life you have been called to. That we do not do whatever is in our means. You know, economics will tell you, live within your means. Isn't that right, budgeting? You guys, the philosophers, the Stoics, the Epicureans, the ones that have studied a lot, you will advise us, live within your means. But let me tell you something. If you're going to live by faith, you cannot afford to live within your means. Did you hear what I just said? Help me tell neighbor, neighbor. If you are going to live by faith, you will not live within your means. Yeah. Faith defies the philosophy of man. Faith defies the wisdom of the world. And he says if you are going to be a partaker of the things that God has given you, those things that pertain to life and to godliness, you must live by faith. You must not live by sight. You must be always living in accordance to those things of which you have the evidence but you have not yet seen. And why do we remind ourselves of the same thing that we know? Because it is very easy to forget the thing you know. That's why you revised the same book. You were in the class. You wrote the notes. You even did the test. Why do you read it again before the exam? I thought you know those things. But as humans, we can easily forget. And I'm here to wake you up, child of God. Arise in faith again in Jesus' name. Refuse to settle for less. I'm telling you, this life of faith sometimes is kind of broken. Uh -huh. And it's very easy to settle for what is obvious. It is very easy to settle for what is predictable. Remember, if you are living a life of faith, there is nothing predictable apart from the fact that God is faithful. That is all. The rest is not predictable. So it is very easy to reach a point and you say, why don't we settle with what we have? It is also good. No, I refuse to do that in Jesus' name. Faith will tell you there is always more. Because faith is not about what you can see. Faith is not about what you have now. Faith is about what you have not yet seen. Making it real. Turning that hope into a reality. Hallelujah. The evidence of things hoped for. The evidence of things hoped for. I refuse to live by sight. I refuse to settle with what I can see now. Because what I cannot see is greater than what I can see. If you had forgotten to live like that, you are losing out on the things that God has already given you. So arise and choose to live by faith. Say, I will live by faith. Let your faith arise again. Refuse to settle for the obvious. You know when things are predictable? It is good. You get your two million and you budget your two million. No debts. Everything is nice. And let me tell you something. Whenever things are predictable and cool and comfortable, God is going to prompt you to disrupt the comfort. Because that is how you, you live by faith again. But if you're going to live by sight, you construct something like this and you settle. And you're like, after all, it is also good. Uh-uh. I refuse to live like that in Jesus' name. What I see is not what I'm looking for. 
what I see cannot make me comfortable, cannot pacify me. And I say, okay, now I think we can settle with this. A life of faith is a life that is always living out for more. Hallelujah. You must live by faith. It is one of these things if you are indeed going to get the things that God has prepared for you. And he says to your faith add what? Add virtue. Another translation says good morals. Another one says goodness. When he talks about virtue, he's talking about being good. Being good to people. It is very important, child of God. Some of us are people of faith, but we are terrible when it comes to handling people. People of faith, you can move mountains, but you can be like that man, that, that, that priest that passed by the man that was by the road. Yet you have faith. Now you need to balance up these things to your faith and your diligence. Add virtue. Be a good person. These things of praying for a whole night. But you cannot just give someone one cave for lunch. Yet you have a hundred thousand in your pocket. What is the use of your faith? To faith add goodness. Hallelujah. Not to goodness add faith. Because it is not the works that come first. When you talk about goodness, it's all going to get into the works. But before we get to the good works, before we go to being good, it is the faith first. Because we do not start with good works. We start with faith. But our faith has a sweet aroma when there is virtue added to it. Not having great faith, but when all the neighbors around you, they always also thank God at one moment. And you know what moment that is? When you are away. They also thank God. To your faith, add goodness. Be a good person. Tell your neighbor, neighbor. Choose to be a good person. These things of moving mountains, but you abuse people like nothing. You've moved mountains with your faith. You command even the lamb to walk. But you cannot be good to your wife. You cannot be good to your husband. You cannot be, you cannot be seen as a good person at the workplace. Do you know why some people may not like your faith? Your great faith? It is because there is no goodness added to it. Your great faith stinks. Great to you, but to others, they are like, how do people come to say that? That's why he says to your faith, add this other thing, add virtue, add goodness. Let people talk about your being good. It is also godly. Hallelujah. Because that one aspect, that one quality, can make you lose out on the things that you are supposed to have. Because not everything is going to come by faith. Some of the things God is going to bring to you will be because of your goodness. Can you even imagine that? Let me tell your neighbor, neighbor. Some of the things God has for you will not come to you by prayer. They will come by goodness. By just you being good. And some of you think that is not very spiritual. Me, as long as I pray and I speak in tongues. No, 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 no. Goodness is a spiritual aspect. Hallelujah. And he says, he says, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. And I think I'll close with this for today. You need to have knowledge. You need to develop your knowledge base. Ignorance can hinder you from attaining some of the things that you're supposed to attain. Ignorance can be such a great barrier to attain
maintaining the promises of God in your life. You cannot afford to be ignorant. You have to choose to gain knowledge. First of all, the knowledge of Christ, the knowledge of the word of God. God has put a lot of treasures for you in his word. But what you don't know, you will never receive. What you don't know, you will never have. Even if you have it, you'll misuse it. You need knowledge. Acquisition of knowledge is your responsibility to your diligence, to your faith, to your goodness. Add knowledge. Choose to be a knowledgeable person. Research. Not only about things in the Bible, but be a knowledgeable person about the things that are going on in the world that you need to know. You don't need to know everything. But there are things you need to know. Otherwise, the world will take you like a fool. What you don't know will hurt you. Help me tell your neighbor, neighbor. What you don't know will hurt you. So you need to know. Those things of Saga Lakumanya, I don't want to know. You have to want to know. Help me tell your neighbor, neighbor. You have to want to know. Hallelujah. You have to want to know. Yeah. Those things, was, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Saga Lakumanya, only know Kumanya, Gamba Kunti Amina. What did God say in Hosea 4 6? He said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge can destroy you. Lack of knowledge can destroy your years. Lack of knowledge can hinder you from being fruitful. You need to know. Know the things to do with Christ, to the, with the promises of God, with the power of God, with the things that God has put in your purview. The things that God has set for you. Say in Jesus name. I choose. To acquire knowledge. Knowledge is important. You need to know. Get up on your feet and we shall pray. Hallelujah. Thank you Lord Jesus. Say in the name of Jesus, I make a declaration today. I will not fail. I will not stumble. I will not be barren. I will not be unfruitful in the work God has given me, in the things that I'm supposed to do. I declare to you, child of God, I'm declaring to you right now. I declare to you, child of God, in the mighty name of Jesus, that you will not be unfruitful. You are not going to be among those that fail to attain the promises of God. I declare that whatever promise God has given you, whatever God has given you pertaining to life and to godliness, you will attain it in this life in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, go ahead and declare with me. Declare that whatever God has set for you, in this life, whatever his divine power has given you in this life, all the riches, all the wealth, all the money, all the influence, whatever God has chosen to give to you according, according to his divine power, according to his divine nature, you will not miss it. You will not miss it. You will not miss it because you are arising in faith. Declare because I'm arising in faith. Because I'm adding goodness to my faith. Because I'm going to be dealing in whatever I do. All the promises of God are coming to pass in my life in accordance to the will of God. Declare it diligently. Declare it diligently. Declare it with faith in the name of Jesus. You will partake of every promise of God in accordance to the will of God unto you in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. I'm telling you, child of God, you will not be counted among the unproductive in Jesus' name. Even at your workplace, you will not be counted among the unproductive in Jesus' name. You will never be counted among the barren in Jesus' name. 
You will even have children in the name of the Lord. Even barrenness of the womb shall not be. You shall not have unfruitful businesses. I rebuke unfruitfulness in businesses in Jesus' name. May your business be fruitful. May it bear fruit in Jesus' name. And I declare upon your life, you will not stand.